It is time for Talking Pints. I'm joined by Lord Norton of Louth, academic, said to be the country's leading expert on Parliament. Where did that come from? It was an article in the House magazine many years ago. I think it was a book review of one of my, I think, uh, one of my, uh, review of one of my books. And the uh, reviewer was saying, um, picking up on a point, saying, is this what our greatest living expert on Parliament should be doing? That type of thing. So it took off from there. And it sort of, once it's entered the currency, everybody uses it. Because how do we introduce yeah. him? Oh, it said he's a great... And so, I know, <laughs> once you've I got know, a brand, I know, well, yeah, absolutely. No, keep it. Keep I always it. know what's coming up. Well, he's, oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, a distinguished academic career, the youngest professor of politics in the United Kingdom. So you spent, you know, your life, your adult life. Oh, yes. And before, absolutely. studying yes. politics, studying parliament. parliament. Yeah. And, of course, I guess our constitution, too. Yes. Um, and because of all of this, you finish up in the House of Lords mm. and various surveys rate your influence over debate as having been quite significant. So well done you for all of that. But I'm, I'm a bit of a radical. Well, I am, aren't I? I mean, I, oh, yes. you know, I am a radical. I mean, supporting leaving the European Union was considered to be an outrageous mm. position, but it became a mainstream position. But, you know, American friends of mine say, Nigel, how can it be that you're on your fourth prime minister in six years and that two of them the British public have never, ever voted for? Our system isn't working very well, is it? Well, it's working perhaps better than the, uh, the, the one where you get your... Uh, uh, Critics, I think there's far more to be said for a parliamentary system of government than the presidential, because that tends to be too rigid in terms of time, uh, in terms of terms, and also the relationship between the president and the executive. You get that disseveration, and of course you get clashes. So there's no accountability. You might think of lots of elections, therefore accountability. Yeah. But in terms of accountability for the outcomes of public policy, who does the electorate hold to account? Who is responsible for that particular output if it's a result of bargaining? Well, I guess in America, in, in America, the midterms are, are a barometer, in of, a sense. Well, that means, yes, but who are you still holding to account? Who holds the power? So yeah, no, it invites a clash between, say, President it, and Congress. So as yes. across here, the parliamentary system, electors are in control, ultimately, because the great thing about elections, I mean, it's Karl Popper's point, he said he made the point that the most important thing was about elections, really, was how can you peacefully get rid of a government? Yeah. So we can get rid of a government, and the electors know why, because the government's responsible for public policy. But here's the odd thing. There's no other... You know, they can't... The government can't say, not us, Gov. You know, there's one body responsible for public policy, the party in government. It's got to face the electors at the next election, and it knows that. Mm -hmm. And it's accountable through the electors as a result. But here's the bizarre thing. The bizarre thing is that, actually, we now have a presidential system at general elections, because we, we, always, because we all vote for somebody we want to be prime minister, or against somebody... We want to be Prime Minister. Isn't that the irony of where we are? It, it would be if that was the case. We vote for a party that's... No, we don't. No, we don't. Well, yes, people don't go to the polls, I'm going to vote for X as Prime Minister. They vote for a party, because they've normally voted for a party, and they will that, believe in that. And I so, think that's changed. I think that's it's changed. It's changed to some extent, but it still gives you that sense of continuity. You've got parties fighting out. You've got party manifestos. So, um, and the leader needs to bring the party behind them. There is a problem in the direction of travel in the sense that um, prime ministers are becoming a little too presidential in the sense of acting as if mm. they were directly elected yes. and they're not. Yes. And that's the problem. Yeah, I know. It's a very odd yeah. situation we've got. Now, sticking with the House of Commons, postal voting. We didn't used to have postal voting. No. Before 2001, you had to have a good reason. Yeah. You're 97 in a wheelchair, you're working abroad, rather as the French still have. Yeah. The French have kept that. I mean, you, you know, you want to vote in France, turn up on the Sunday and vote as it was here on a Thursday. Blair brought in PPERA, postal vote on demand, actually for the first goodness knows how many years, without even proof of identity or address, mm. just ring up and ask yeah. for a postal vote. Yeah. And, and, and when I genuinely think there is widespread fraud and intimidation within our postal voting system, especially in some of the ethnic minorities. Isn't it about time? Why, why will no one deal with this? Well, some are attempting to deal with it, and some of us did raise this problem when 
postal voting was introduced, because in effect it almost it basically under, as the, undoes the P ballot act to provide for secret voting. This yes. is the whole yes. point. Yes. I made the point that the, the, the polling booth is secret, the living room isn't. So who can see how you're voting? It completely undermined the whole purpose of what the ballot act was about in the first place. So there are reasons to worry about it. Um, and it lends itself to whether there's voting fraud or not, perceptions of it, because you feel, well, that could happen. So should we go back to the old system? We need to tighten up. Now, whether you can introduce sec more secure ways of voting, because it might not be postal voting, but online voting and, and tighten up security. But you're absolutely right in sense there's there's a problem to be addressed in terms of the actual mechanism of the process. But the other point you're touching on is perceptions of the system. Mm. And, of course, you need to have confidence in it. So what do we need to do to actually ensure that people yeah. are well, confident about yeah, the system? Yeah. And also, of course, you know, a Labour MP dies, the by-election's called, the post, you know, nominations close within a couple of days, the postal votes go out the next day, the other parties haven't even had time hmm. to get ready for it, and 60% of the turnout is on postal vote oh, way before so, election yes. day itself. That needs dealing with. Quick point on electoral reform before we get on to the big one, the House of Lords. <laughs> when Blair said to Roy Jenkins, you know, go away and look at the electoral system, and Jenkins did it. Yeah. And he came back and said, AV Plus would be a good system. You'd maintain the link. The man or woman would still represent Guildford, albeit Guildford would be you know, 10 yeah. or 15,000 more people, but there'd be a list, a top-up list, where any significant opinion that wasn't represented on the first-past-the-post would get a voice in the Palace of Westminster. I think that's a very good system. Why has it never been adopted? Uh, because it's a very bad system. Um, and there's a very good campaign against Jenkins and the AV um, uh, report they produce, because, I mean, in a way, um, the reason they came up with AV... Plus, Plus, it was a hybrid system because their terms yeah. of reference were basically incompatible. Um, uh, so they couldn't square, it was an attempt to square the circle with a system that wouldn't particularly work. So I say there's a very effective campaign, I know, because I was part of it, and I actually drafted the, uh, the report in opposition to AV+, Plus, so explaining what the problem <coughs> was, or, if you like, in defence of our existing system. So you'd stick with first past the post? Yes. Yes, I mean, it comes back... So to how can I... Come on. Well, it comes how, back... How can I, how can I, as leader of UKIP, get four million votes and one seat? Is that a fair electoral system? Well, it depends how you define fairness. I um, mean, this is... Oh, no, no, come well, on. Well, no, no. I mean, um, in any reasonable it, person's mind. Well, yes, but it, it comes back to my point. What criteria are you using? You say, well, you've got X number of votes. What right? looks reasonable? Well, reasonable in terms of how do you choose who's going to govern. That's the key point. Now, if you... Go for Should our Parliament well, if it was, not represent big, significant views in this country? Ah, it may represent views, but the problem is then the aggregate would work against having a government that's accountability, because you just have lots of parties. Um, who, who forms the government? Well, it, we had a coalition from 2010 to 2015. Pre I mean, I mean, exactly my point. You look at the problems there. What could people vote on at the next election? Because the programme for government was post-election bargaining. So there was nothing that was... Cho the voters didn't have a chance yeah, to vote on... No, they... I get that. I get your point, but you must see my point oh, as yeah, well. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I can mean, understand. I, mean, I personally but feel it, aggrieved by the but, system. But, you no, know, quite, but my point is, if you like, it's a balance which is, if you like, which is more <coughs> fair. The, yeah. you, you've got competing choices yeah, between yeah. your point about fairness yeah, yeah. in terms of spread of the vote, yeah. my point about fairness in terms of electors actually being able to cho choose the government or hold the government accountable, whoever's been in power, um, for I public see policy. Yeah. No, look, I think we should have a second chamber. I think a revising Good. chamber is very sensible. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, have experts either in the chamber or committees they call upon. Yeah. Look at legislation. Say to the House of Commons, you've been too hasty. You haven't thought this through. Please have a rethink. I absolutely, the bicameral system, I'm with it. Yeah. I think a House of Lords that is now stuffed with 300 of Tony Blair's mates, 250 of Cameron's mates, uh, party donors. Uh, I mean, the whole thing stinks of corruption. It looks absolutely awful. If the British public were given a say on this, Lord Norton, they'd get rid of it tomorrow. Well, they would, because, I mean, I saw a poll that said only 12% thought it worked well. Yes. But um, that's partly because 
generally people aren't aware of what the Lords actually does. It's a generalised perception, the sort you mentioned. Oh, it's all but who's in it? Who's in it? All their mates? Uh, no, no, th th that's your point I was going to pick you up because you're in it stuffed with. Yeah. So, um, and somebody said, Hundreds oh, of them. Ah, well, exactly. There's, we're a large house, we're too large. Now, on your person, basis, therefore, if you say, there's hundreds. Well, there aren't. You start naming the hundreds. You can start with a few names and then you'd run out. You then come into your point. It's the experts, the people who are appointed. So even if you look at the numbers, we are too big. Yep. We favour reform in the Lords. The government's the problem in not going along with what we're to do to reform the House. What would your reform be? Well, I'm being responsible for some reforms because we've got private members' legislation enacted, including the House of Lords Reform Act 2014. That's the one that allowed peers to retire, got rid of anybody yeah. who commits a serious criminal offence, got rid of anybody who doesn't attend. That makes a nice change. Yes, yeah. yeah, so, <laughs> and anybody who doesn't attend for a session. So that was one. We got another one on expulsion and suspension the following year. And I've got actually a bill coming up this Friday um, House of Lords Peerage Nomination Bill, which I stand, it's to put the House of Lords Appointments Commission on a statutory basis, but it does much more than that. It addresses some of the concerns you've touched upon mm. in terms of transparency. Um, so it affects numbers, it, independence, but also requires party leaders, if they're nominating peers, to uh, give the Commission an explanation of the process, the criteria by which those names were chosen, to supply any Wouldn't other information. Easier? Wouldn't it be easier just, just, just to have an elected House of Lords, no. you know, one seven-year term, something like that, and maybe get people in there... Uh, from all walks of life, elected well, on PR, be far more representative, wouldn't it? And then they no, can choose it, expert committees. Oh, no, where do we start with all that? Because um, <laughs> We haven't got time. <laughs> well, no, but it, it, it would then, because you, you're in conflict there with what you're prescribing and the attributes you've given to a second chamber. The, doing it that way would actually that. destroy those Well, attributes. not if you call on expert committees, etc. Ah, I, no, but... I, my view is it just looks corrupt. Oh, the whole I, thing looks well, corrupt. That's what my bill's designed to address, because there's that perception, and we need to get rid of it. It's a bit, like, right. it's a bit like my point about um, postal voting, the answer yeah. to that. Yeah. It's how people perceive it. We must address that. We are coming up with all sorts of ways of doing that. So we've had some achievements. We're pressing for more. Well, if you it's can actually make, getting government on board to actually, if Lord actually Lord, If you it. can make it a bit better than it is, you'll be doing a very good job. And thank you. We're moving in the right direction. For joining me on Talking Pints. Thank you.